Hey folks, welcome back to uh, Mythborn and all things that are Mythborn. I'm pretty excited today to talk to you guys about um, Comic-Con Fairfax that I just finished attending. Uh, it was an amazing event. People were dressed up so nicely, and I just think it's it's just really cool when you get to see people express the cool, this, how they love science fiction and fantasy. Uh, I thought the various exhibits were amazing. I thought, the, as I said, the costumes were amazing. Um, people were very nice. And uh, the the venue was really nice also. We had a couple of little funny um, issues with trying to find power and plug things in. But uh, in the end, uh, our ingenuity paid off, and we managed to uh, get everything working and running correctly. Definitely check online and look at our shots and stuff we posted about it. It was a really fun time. Um, I'd also urge anyone who is online or watching this, if you haven't already subscribed to MythbornMedia.com or to our Facebook page at Mythborn Media, please do so. It makes it makes it really easy for us to get you the content you're going to be interested in. The fact is that a lot is happening, and it's happening quickly, and we try and post as much as possible. But um, without a doubt, if you're part of our list, uh, you will hear the latest and greatest things like, Book three, which is now in its final sort of um, run through its editing process, and we have an amazing artist who's working on the cover. I think it's going to look amazing. It's a actually a pull shot of the phoenix that sits atop the floating city of Avalon, and the phoenix is the uh, symbol of Valerius Galadine. And uh, without giving away too much, um, his house symbol uh, made of carved out of wood, sits atop this spherical tree city that floats through the skies of Arcadia. And um, our artist did an amazing job of just getting the look and feel of the vista of Arcadia correct. And I think he's nailed it when it comes to how amazing the city looks. So I can't wait to share the cover and its finality with you. There's a very early preview online right now that you can see uh, a very rough sketch from our artist to show you sort of the composition and things like that. So if you're interested in seeing great art, uh, more like the last, then definitely check out our website, www.mythbornmedia.com, or like us on Facebook, and uh, we'll make sure that you see our latest posts and get to see the things we're working on. So that'd be really great. Today, oh, I also want to announce I'm going to be at BlurredCon July 27th to 29th, and that'll be in Crystal City. Uh, that's here in the area, near Virginia, Maryland, D.C. It's actually uh, just bordering uh, Washington, D.C. Um, and so BlurredCon, and that'll be, again, July 27th to 29th. Like I said, I have to keep notes for myself because date's not my thing. Um, let's see. Today we're going to talk about the Houses of um, Eden, uh, but more importantly, I think, as we go through the houses, I wanted to give people a little insight into, like, the martial arts of each of these houses and how they go about doing what they do. So today we'll talk about House Galadine and House Tyr, and then next week we'll talk about House Caden and uh, House Aeonian. So the main character in the book, or one of the main characters in the book, Niall Galadine, is the son of the Imperial, of Imperial King Galadine, uh, Bernal Galadine, and his wife, Yvain. Uh, they, own, they run their country from the fortress of Barakor. Barakor is situated on the um, western side of a desert. Actually, if you look at the map, and by the way, there's a fantastic uh, map out also. I don't know if you can see it over my shoulder back here, but this area right here is the impact crater I'm talking about. Um, that area... Barakor is right there, and uh, there's this fortress's ring, the desert. This is called the Alton Waste. So what's great about um, House Galadine and about the fortress itself is um, the Galadines took over after a long uh, war in which uh, Bernal Galadine wanted to unite all the forces of um, – uh, or I'm sorry, unite all the people – um, in general, the world had been invaded by demons again and again, and eventually uh, they were repulsed and pushed back through the gate, and the gate was closed. The gate is right over here, 
around this area right here. And um, once the gate was closed, people came back towards uh, the main area of the fortresses and they started to, to rule, the galley started to rule, um, and I, I'd like to say they did it in a nice way, but in, in essence, like in most things, uh, it was through civil war. So House Gallatin went to war. Um, they quickly subjugated the various houses. The last one to, um, to fall was um, House Caden, and House Caden holds the fortress of Shornhelm. Shornhelm is right here on the map, near the southern side. So Veracor's right here. We're talking about that one. And Evensea right here, which is the House Tier fortress. So these two are on the east and west side of the of the desert of, Thaw, of um, the Alton Waste. So Galad the Galadines, um, you know, the victors write the histories, and they write themselves in as really great people who uh, brought peace and prosperity to the world. But to some extent, they really drove hard on the various other houses. Uh, they used every trick in the book in order to win mostly might of arms. Uh, the house, the house Galleon has a, uh, a team of, of bladesmen that uh, are really quite excellent at, at what they do. Uh, they descended from an ancient group that had been hired ultimately to protect mages during battle so the mages could deal with the demons that were invading and the bladesmen could deal with any demons that were either magically immune, uh, had resistance, or they could set up a defense against warriors of, of these demons or possessed, which are more like zombies. Um, and they could defend these mages so that they had time to close the rifts that would create um, you know, more demons to come through. So if you can imagine in the warfare, what would happen is a planar gate would open, demons would pour out, uh, the fortresses, whoever was closest would respond with their teams. Um, they would go with battle mages and with these bladesmen, they would basically hold a front. The mages would start sealing the rift while the bladesmen would fight off these demons. And then as soon as the rift was sealed, more forces would come in, and they got pretty good at quickly subjugating um, most of these um, most of these these creatures that would come through the gates uh, long before they could possess too many people. Once a person was possessed, they essentially became the personality of the demon. And they could, they, they, you never would, up until now, you've never gotten that person back again. They were essentially dead, and their body was used by the demon to have a corporeal existence in the land of Eden. Um, the other side of the gate is a world called Arcadia, which you just heard me talk about as the cover of book three. Arcadia and Eden sort of sit on either side of these gates with. Arcadia being this sort of realm of creatures called the Eris that uh, can possess people if they want. They're insubstantial, but they are molded and um, created by, by faith. And so the people of Eden, their belief in gods and in demons and everything else is what create the Eris. So House Galadin did a really good job of uh, essentially taking over everything. After they did that, um, they ended up taking a lot of time to try and actually bring peace. And over the years, it's been about 200 years now when the books start, uh, they have managed to go from being a, an imperium or a, an empire um, to being almost like a, a quasi uh, democratic dictatorship. I don't even know if that works, but that's sort of how they look at things. They try and uh, uphold the Senate, and they try and uphold the vote, and they want people, they want the people to be involved. Uh, the current king, Bernal Galadine, is a, essentially a, a very uh, liberal-minded person. He's rescinded the orders that kill mages on sight. Um, mages took the blame for all these demon rifts and were hunted down and, and, and killed for the most part. And they've um, managed to create a pretty amazing martial style based on bladed weapons. Uh, these bladesmen, they are fast. They, they, they wear light armor. The, because the fortress is in the desert, they don't use a lot of heavy armor. They're mostly 
uh, cotton, leather, um, things that breathe, things that are flexible. Uh, they are single-edged blades in general. Uh, they are known to be uh, amazing swordsmen. And um, the Galadines really sort of have brought the, the idea of martial um, prowess with handheld weapons um, sort of to the forefront. The other house uh, that we're going to talk about today is House Tyr. House Tyr is held by King Benthor Tyr and his wife Clarissa. Uh, Clarissa happens to be the sister of Bernal Galadine at Barakor. And so uh, Barakor is the fortress for the Galadines, and Evensea is the fortress for, or the castle for, um, or the home, whatever you want to call it, for the Tears. Um, the Tears are a family that resides in a coastal town. Think of them as sort of like uh, a lot like Boston. They have a very uh, busy port, busy harbor. Um, a lot of ships and a lot of trade uh, goes through there. If you look over on the map, they are right here on the map. And this water body of water goes out and actually is an inland sea that then ultimately makes it out to the main sea. So there's a couple of ways that they can get out to the main sea. And that because of this, this area here for them has become a very um, profitable and uh, luxurious kind of, um, I don't want to say it's a monopoly, but eh, it's sort of a monopoly. I mean, ultimately they control many of the goods that come in from um, the rest of the world um, that are to the east of the Alton Waste. Obviously in South Hart, and the Sun Coast Sea and the Sun Tree and these, they have plenty of trade. But if you are this side of the Alton Waste, then you're going to be relying a lot on Tyr and the various outposts of Tyr they have uh, going down from Morning Light to Deep Look to Last Reach to Sunhold. Um, all these different ports are based on uh, a very vigorous set of trade that brings goods and, and sends goods east and west. So the Tears are uh, known for fighting with double weapons, um, two short swords. They're also known for fighting with tridents and spears. They're very, very adept at staff and spear, longer weapons, um, and also shorter style sabers and cutlasses and, and short swords, things you would be able to use effectively in ship-to-ship -ship fighting, um, or uh, you can keep people at a distance in ship-to-ship -ship fighting. So uh, think of them as uh, Corsairs. They are, uh, they are very good on their feet, very balanced, very nimble, and they, uh, they really feel comfortable in the water. If there was a, a specialized, you know, each house has their own team of, you know, what you would consider to be their best warriors. Well, if... Um, the Galadines are the Marine Force Recon, or the Marines of, oh, not even Marines, sorry, the Army of, um, of Eden. I think House Tyr would be like the SEAL teams of, of Eden. They are really, really designed to work uh, in warfare from uh, ships to land and land to ships. So think of Galadine as the Army. Uh, think of House Tyr as the Marines or as SEALs. Um, and so uh, their daughter, Yateji, is the character on the cover of book one, and she and the son of King, she's the daughter of, um, of King Benthor Tyr, uh, so Yateji Tyr is the princess of Evensea, and uh, she joins Nile uh, over in Barakor while she is doing her walk of kings, which is a walk that goes around from each fortress, one of the heirs will walk. Uh, to each of the other fortresses in order to learn governorship, leading, to be seen, uh, to create better bonds between the various families, and also to sort of prove themselves. Uh, the book begins with Yateji having made it halfway around uh, to Dawnlight and then down to Barakor uh, on the western side of the Alton Waste. Um, she was, a, she was uh, ambushed around here somewhere just before she got there and uh, had a pretty pitched fight um, it was the first time she's taken a life. And so when we meet her in um, Barakor, 
she is still recovering from that, and she's also, um, I think the the fact that she's been in life and death combat has um, matured her a little bit more than she might have been prior to that. Uh, she's very much, or was very much, just a, sort of a princess, but now that she's had to face another person and uh, and she has killed them, um, you find that she's very, she's much more pragmatic about how things happen. And she's a great counterpoint to Niall, who is still unblooded, who's still trying to prove himself in the eyes of his father and mother. And he is, you know, constantly sort of part bravado, part uh, bragging, part um, trying his best to, to, you know, he's sure he can handle any situation. Um, and, you know, he wants to get on the wall. He wants to fight. He wants to go do all these things. And Itenji is like the friend who doesn't um, doesn't gainsay him for wanting to do that. She understands it, but in her mind, uh, all of that stuff that used to be adventure sounding and and awesome uh, has become for her much more real and much much more realistic in terms of the way that she deals with things. So she's the voice of reason. She's careful more so than she used to be, uh, but she's not cowardly. She's just careful. She understands now how, what a fine edge life can lay on uh, and, and how important it is to, you know, take things seriously, to keep your, you know, eyes open, to understand what's going on around you. She's not really uh, that interested anymore in um, the life of a, of a very, uh, you know, um, privileged royalty. Uh, I think she sees that anyone can be killed at any time, and it doesn't matter what family you're born into in the world of Eden. Uh, death is right around the corner. Gates can open anywhere. Demons can show up at any time. Uh, and along with that are all the things that normal humanity has. There are robbers and burglars, and there are assassins and people who want to do you harm. And uh, she has – all of that has become very real for her. So um, – I love the way the book starts. It has someone who, through flashbacks, you can see that she was, you know, probably less serious. Um, but now the person you meet, she seems older than Niall, even though they're the same age, about 17 years old. She seems much older because of what she's been through. And I think she is a good influence on Niall as he uh, starts to learn what life is about. Anyways, guys, uh, I want to go more into depth in uh, House Caden and House Aeonian next week. I also want to talk more about the martial arts, about magic, about the systems that how this, you know, how this world works and works together. Uh, I also think it'd be fun to just maybe map out a little bit of the history. I jumped around a little bit in this conversation because there's so much information and I don't, uh, I don't want to leave anything out, but I also uh, don't want to just tell you something out of context. So uh, in trying to put context in and around what I'm telling you, uh, sometimes, you know, you get the, the jump around, but if you read the books, there is an entire world and a history that I've written out um, before I ever started writing. Um, I've created conflict maps. I have um, conflict maps of who likes who, who doesn't like who, who would, what would happen if these two people met. Um, I'll put up a diagram of how that works too. I'll put up on Facebook so you guys can see it. And um, you know, it's a it's a process to create a world. Uh, when we did Elder Scrolls, uh, when we worked on Lord of the Rings Online, when we worked on all the different games that I've done, it takes a lot of effort for an RPG to come to life because there's so much backstory that needs to be created and so much world building that needs to happen in order for the world to feel real. One of the things that I've been trying, uh, I've really, really tried hard to avoid in every situation is what I call a white room syndrome, which is a scene written or a background written just so you can have two people fight or two people talk or something. The backdrop itself has no life. It has no history. It has no purpose other than to be the, the cube within which these two people or three people interact. Um, I tried very hard not to ever do that in the book. Every place people go has a history. It has a background. Uh, it has people who live there and who care about that place as much as people care about Barracor or care about Evensea. Um, these places are real places in the world, and, and they suffer when uh, people don't pay attention to their defense. So I'm looking forward to book three. Uh, I'm a 
busy on book four, and um, I think it's going to be a fun year, guys. So join me for our next broadcast next week. I hope I see you at uh, BlurredCon, uh, again, that July 27th to 29th in Crystal City. And um, I really am looking forward to uh, hopefully meeting you guys at BlurredCon. If you're local, um, certainly posting from BlurredCon and doing another live event at the show or multiple live events at the show. So stay tuned. Go to MythmoreMedia.com and register with us. Uh, like us on Facebook. Check out the book on Amazon if you haven't already gotten it. Check out the amazing cover art that we've gotten so far and how lucky we are for that. And, uh, you know, tune in. We have news every, every week, and uh, I'm looking forward to sharing this world with all of you. Take care. You're going to watch me hit the button now to say see ya. <laughs> see ya.